Okay, thank you. Uh, probably this is the only session throughout this uh, summer school where speaker is, is not talking about Nash equilibrium or any refinement of Nash equilibrium. And I will even talk about some monetary policy as well. So. Okay, uh, this lecture is based on uh, my research uh, spanning over the last 20 years on learning. And uh, recently I've been working on some learning where the agent is endowed with some faulty model or misspecified model or wrong model. And uh, let's talk about, and uh, this lecture is based on a series of my papers with Ken Casa. Actually, Ken Casa used to work at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. So all the risk, uh, description of the behavior of the monetary policymaker is accurate because that's what he used to do. Uh, I'll spend most of the time about uh, this uh, first paper, and uh, toward the end of the talk, I'll talk about, I'll refer to uh, the third paper. And uh, the one in the middle is kind of mild extension of what we did. So let's just go to some basic example. And for this audience, it may be too much, but at least as long as you pass the first year macro prelim, I, you should know what this equation is. You did. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> this equation is known as uh, a surprising model. And uh, this is a kind of one of the workhorse model in macro literature. Also in fi uh, finance as well. So this, uh, this uh, dynamic equation uh, says uh, price today is a function of some real variable ZT. Uh, you can read PT as uh, exchange rate or asset price and ZT as a GDP or any other real variable. But the important part is this uh, today's price is a function of my expectation about tomorrow's price. Okay? And this uh, uh, parameter alpha represents how important my expectation is for today's price. For that reason, we call this alpha as a feedback parameter. So if you assume alpha equals zero, it's a kind of exogenous uh, stochastic process. PT is exogenous stochastic process, but alpha, when alpha is positive, there is a certain form of feedback between my expectation and actual price we observe. Uh, in, this is a very much textbook example, and uh, we usually assume that the ZT, this real variable, or GDP, evolved according to the AR1 process. So throughout my talk, just, uh, just uh, we assume that the delta, alpha, rho are positive numbers. Uh, for convenience, uh, please uh, imagine where alpha, so we calibrate these numbers uh, in the actual work, and usually alpha and rows are calibrated to some number close to one. So please uh, assume that this alpha and rows are some positive number close to one. It's less than one, but close to one. So uh, probably in, the, in your first year macroeconomics, first year macroeconomics, probably the first problem set should be calculate the rational expectation equilibrium of this model. So by using this uh, guess and verify technique, you can show uh, rational expectation equilibrium price process is given as a PT is a function of uh, uh, ZT and some, uh, some shock. Okay? So uh, that's equilibrium, but uh, let's talk about a case where this agent knows this uh, functional form. Okay, PT is some constant of ZT and shock, but I do not know, I do not know the cost, uh, this co constant. Yeah? So imagine yourself as a Bayesian who, who does not observe this co constant, and uh, assuming that uh, so you, you have a PT, this, you have uh, this uh, functional equation, this PT equal beta T and ZT, and uh, you assume this beta T is a constant, but you do not observe. But as a, as a Bayesian, you have a prior belief, and uh, following the uh, practitioner, let's assume you have a Gaussian, Gaussian prior, and uh, you update your prior as you observe the more info, uh, data price PT. Okay? Uh, 
uh, ZT. And uh, we, uh, let's, uh, there is certain issues about uh, contemporary shocks, but uh, we'll, we'll just ignore that part. Yeah. So uh, you, do not, uh, you have some unknown, unknown parameter, and as a Bayesian, you have a uh, prior. Let's assume that it's a Gaussian. And the posterior of Gaussian is also Gaussian. Therefore, we can keep track of your posterior by two numbers. One is a conditional mean and conditional variance. And uh, uh, this conditional mean, beta t, and uh, conditional variance, sigma t, evolve according to this recursive formula known as a Kalman filter. Okay. So just an uh, important observation is that the beta t is 0, which uh, is a function of uh, today's uh, estimator, conditional mean, and a uh, function of pt minus beta t 0 z, z t, where beta t 0 z t is your forecasted price, and pt is your actual observation. Therefore, the difference is forecasting errors. So important part of observation is tomorrow's conditional mean is a function of, function of today's conditional mean plus forecasting error, and uh, the influence of this today's forecasting error in updating uh, conditional mean is determined by this coefficient, sigma t over sigma square, sigma t zt square, which uh, is known as a Kalman gain. Okay. And the second equation uh, it, uh, specifies how this conditional variance evolves over time. It's known as a Riccati equation. And uh, this pair of this equation determines how posterior evolve over time. So we know, in this case, we know this uh, conditional mean vanishes at the, at the rate of 1 over t over time, and the uh, conditional mean converges to rational expectation equilibrium. Yeah. So this is kind of a straightforward application of Bayes' rule where uh, prior satisfy grain of truth assumption. So it's not that surprising to see uh, my conditional mean converge to rational expectation equilibrium so that uh, you can say, even though I do not observe or I don't know at the beginning of the game what the ratio, e equilibrium is, but uh, if I'm rational, if I'm Bayesian, and if my prior include uh, equilibrium, then eventually I behave as if I learn to play the uh, rational expectation equilibrium. So if you plot the beta t, at the beginning when t is small, there may be some juggles, but it converges to rational expectation equilibrium in a rather predictable way. Okay, let's go back to some uh, practice. The challenge of this class of model, probably you may have heard in your first year uh, macroeconomic class, that uh, this class of model fit the data really badly. Especially, when, uh, this class of model cannot explain the price volatility in the market. So, the equilibrium price, uh, equi where is ZT? Okay, equilibrium price process says, much, when you factor out volatility of real price ZT, there should be ZT. Uh, uh, volatility of uh, real, uh, real, real sector, the rest of price volatility should be explained by this uh, volatility of epsilon T. But uh, in order to explain uh, actual volatility, you have to make a very extreme assumption about the epsilon T. That's kind of very well known uh, deficiency of this class of model. So what econometricians do is, okay, instead of assuming that the beta t is constant, let's assume that beta t evolves according to a uh, random walk, okay, which is known as a time-varying parameter model. And I was told that this is a very kind of handy way of incorporating unmodeled structural change of the system. So I'm an econometrician. And I'm kind of suspicious about my model, validity of my model. And uh, I, I'm suspicious that there may be some structural change, but I cannot model it. But uh, I want to capture this uh, structural change in a very uh, parsimonious way, and this is the way how we do. Okay? So instead of beta t constant, we assume that beta t evolve according to random work. And we usually assume that uh, this sigma uh, Vt, which is a kind of innovation term, uh, let's assume that it's a Gaussian, orthogonal to epsilon t, and sigma V is small. Okay. And uh, 
there is a, also there is a corresponding karma filter to uh, update your belief about the beta and the variance, and which is uh, given almost identical way, except look at the second equation. There is a, uh, there is a sigma v. I mean, this uh, variance of innovation term is now positive. Therefore, this conditional variance does not vanish to zero, but converge to some positive number in a very rapid way. Okay? So uh, this beta t process uh, does not converge a particular number, but we can show we can show as t goes to infinite, this beta t conditional mean, which is a stochastic process, converge to stationary distribution. And this stationary distribution collapses to rational expectation equilibrium as the innovation term becomes small. So that's also kind of well-known result. Okay. So as t goes to infinite, this uh, conditional variance, conditional, conditional mean, converges to stationary distribution instead of a single number. And uh, as uh, this innovation term becomes small, Sigma v, which, uh, which parameterize the size of a shock in the uh, coefficient, becomes small. The stationary distribution converges to rational expectation equilibrium in a weak sense. Here is a, here is a problem. Where does this, this uh, vt come from? This vt has nothing to do with uh, economic. Fundamentals of economy, it comes from here, right? It comes from here. Uh, in fact, this kind of idea has been used in the literature under different disguise. Uh, somebody like uh, uh, Jim Bullard call it uh, judgment. Uh, Jim Bullard is uh, one of the FOMC member, so he's an actual policymaker. So he observed that this uh, policymaker sometimes use his own judgment rather than just uh, accepting what the uh, recommendation from the econometricians. And this sigma v, or vt term, can be modeled as a judgment. Okay. Or uh, Ben Habib and his col uh, collaborators talk about uh, the sentiment. So market, uh, market volatility sometimes is affected by s sentiment of traders. And uh, VT can be viewed as a sentiment of the decision makers. So all those, fe all those uh, common feature of this interpretation is, this is some variable which has nothing to do with fundamentals of economy and appears to affect the uh, endogenous variable of the economy. OK. But uh, that's not the way how. Uh, Econometricians in the Federal Reserve behave. Actually, I observed it. Okay. Uh, they, are, they are much more smarter than that because uh, now they have a model with time varying variable model, and uh, they are really sure about whether this is a correct model or not. And they are well aware their model may be wrong. So, what they do is they want to hedge. Okay. So there is a one model where this coefficient is unknown constant. Okay? Uh, because this model does not fit the data very well, so he, in, he invented time varying parameter model by assuming that beta t may evolve according to random walk, which I'm going to call script M1. Okay? Because he's not so sure, so he doesn't want to head. He doesn't want to commit himself to a particular model. So what they do is they average the model. That procedure is known as uh, uh, model averaging. So what they do is they uh, the decision maker has a prior belief about which model is correct. Okay? And uh, he combined two models according to this belief. And based on this combined model, he take an action, or uh, PT is realized. Based on PT, he update conditional mean of the first model, where you believe beta t is constant. 
and uh, you update coefficient of the time varying parameter model where you believe beta t is not a constant but evolve over time. So instead of committing yourself to a particular model, you keep track of posterior and coefficient of different models. And uh, this is a kind of exercise. Uh, uh, my exercise is to understand the asymptotic property of this learning dynamics. In fact, if you look at the uh, econometrics literature, my econometrics education stopped 30 years ago. So what I did just uh, went through the uh, uh, literature and noticed that uh, this uh, model averaging process is kind of a good, good practice. That's what, uh, if you look at Alan Timberman's survey on the model averaging, uh, he just, uh, through the, uh, whether it's a Bayesian model averaging or a non-Bayesian model averaging, it's considered as desirable practice because it often produces a robust, stable, and accurate forecast. In fact, in fact, uh, you will see, uh, you see a pol monetary policymaker like a Federal Reserve sometimes announce uh, expected growth rate of next year. These numbers are often based on the average of different forecasters. Okay? So it's a, averaging the forecast is a very well accepted practice because of this also, uh, alleged properties of this averaging process. Okay? And throughout this lecture, I assume this behavior is given. I'm not going to ask why they do that. I just, ask, I just take their behavior, this model averaging behavior as given, and I want to see what the consequence is. The main difference is, in econometrics or statistics, data generating process is exogenous. So their goal is, okay, here is stochastic process. I want to know the uh, statistical property of this uh, stochastic process. That's their goal. Okay? But in economics, especially if you are the decision maker, because of this feedback, your belief influences the data generating process. So data generating process is no longer exogenous. And uh, I want to show you even though model leveraging process is well accepted, support, allegedly produce robust, what's that? I forgot that. Robust, stable, and accurate forecast. I'm going to show you one example, the textbook example, where this model averaging will lead to unstable and inaccurate forecast with probability one. That's the goal of our lecture. And then I'll show you what could be the alternative approach to this kind of situation. Uh, this paper is uh, inspired, this exercise was inspired by the uh, earlier paper, Evans, Honkapoya, and Sargent, and Williams. And uh, they did some numerical exercise uh, for this class of problem and find some kind of puzzling feature. And uh, we just kind of uh, take that exercise and solve the problem. And in doing so, we made some very sharp critique toward this uh, well-accepted uh, practice of model leverage. Right. Okay, so this is what we are talking about. So think about the uh, uh, policymaker who does not want to commit himself to a particular model so in one side, M0, he be, uh, that's the model that pre presume the beta is constant but unobserved. Another model, M1, beta evolved according to uh, random walk process. Okay? And the pi is his posterior, pi t is his posterior, that true model is uh, time bearing parameter model. Okay? So, if you, okay, so at time t, at time t, so this answer your, your question as well. Yeah. 
Uh, that's a non-Bayesian. Okay. Yes. I, I, I decide to do the Bayesian in just make sure that, that there is no room for uh, ad hoc learning a, as minimal as possible. It's not, it's not, it's not. Just uh, this, uh, I, I just assume Bayesian to make sure this guy is not, is very rational. Okay. <laughs> it's very rational. And uh, you will see there is a certain form of uh, mystification floating around in the bed. And that causes a big problem in the end. Okay? So given pi t, that's the posterior. So my, the, my expected price tomorrow is a convex combination of forecast generated by model 0, where I assume it's an unknown constant, or model 1, where I assume beta t evolved according to random walk. And that's the average. And uh, this average forecast influence today's price. This is where the feedback comes in. And but the, based on PT, I apply Bayes' rule so that pi t, beta t1, beta t0 is updated according to Bayes' rule. Yeah? I, I'm not, I, my econometrics, especially time series econometrics, Knowledge is kind of minimal. So what I do is I just uh, take a, what is the standard textbook for the time series econometrics? Hamilton? Yeah, Hamilton. It's around, yeah, this book, the thick book, and go through, and uh, around uh, page 437, there is a formula for updating this pi t, and the formula updating for beta betas. So I just copy that, okay, to make sure I do not make a mistake. So I try to be very, textbook as textbook as possible. The only difference is the data generating process is now endogenous. That's the only departure from the standard uh, time series exercise. Okay, so if pi t converges to zero, okay, so we are interested in the asymptotic property of pi t, beta t zero, and beta t one. And the uh, variable of interest is pi t. So if pi t converge to zero, that means in the long run, the uh, decision maker believes that constant parameter model is a correct model. If you do so, he learns the rational expectation equilibrium. But if the pi t does not converge to zero, then he ends up believing some wrong model with positive probability. So pi t, especially the asymptotic property of pi t, is uh, the variable of interest. Okay. Is that ready? So, so here's the main result. So in the long run, uh, beta t1 and beta t0 uh, converge to rational expectation equilibrium, which is not too surprising, okay? So beta t0 converge to rational expectation value with the probability one, beta t1 converge to rational expectation equilibrium in a weak sense. But the dip other than this uh, difference in the metric, they converge to rational expectation equilibrium. But the question is where the pi t converges. So in order to this, uh, idea, formalize this idea of uh, convergence, we use the following uh, measure. Fixing capital T. Let's count how many period pi t stay around one. Okay, this, uh, given small epsilon, given small epsilon, let's count how many times before capital T pi t visited in that small neighborhood. Okay, it may be zero, it may be some positive, okay? And that's a t epsilon one. So this is a random variable because uh, pi t is a random variable. So pi t, ipsi, pi, uh, t one epsilon over t represent the proportion of time where pi t remains kind of visit, stay around one. That is proportion of time where when decision maker believes true model is time varying parameter model or he believes 
uh, this uh, variable evolve according to random walk, which is uh, essentially pigment of his imagination. Okay. And the theorem says, if alpha rho is bigger than half, almost always you believe time varying parameter model. But if alpha rho, alpha rho is less than half, you will believe constant parameter model. For economists, alpha and rho are, are collaborated to close to one. Therefore, alpha rho is a uh, product of alpha rho is bigger than half usually. That means if there is a feedback in a textbook example of uh, a surprising model, whenever you have a slight uncertainty about the model you have, remember, constant parameter model is a correct model in a sense that if you believe this model is true, you will eventually learn the rational expectation equilibrium. The reason why you start talk about, think about uh, this uh, time varying parameter model is you are not so sure. Okay? And as soon as you start to consider this uh, additional model on the back, you start to believe something else with the probability one. That's the conclusion. So as a result, this, uh, this uh, Bayesian model averaging process, which is supposed to produce robust, stable, accurate prediction, produce inaccurate prediction with probability one. That's the conclusion. So what the criteria is, how determine the nation's conclusion? Uh, he, what they did, actually, not, not only Timmerman and but also if you look at the economic research, literature, they did some uh, particular problem in the empirical work and show that when, you, when the average the prediction, it performs better in this particular example, in the particular example, that's, the, that's what they prove. So there is no analytic result and uh, no feedback and so on. Actually, it's not, a, it's not a good question to ask what they think, what economists think about data generating process, endogenous data generating process. Actually, I asked this question to uh, Bruce Hansen. He's kind of a leader uh, in the, this uh, model averaging literature, non-Bayesian model averaging literature. His response was very simple. Why do you want to think about that problem? Because I said, for econometricians, the, their view is data generating process is exogenous. But here, because of this feedback between my expectation and my influence to the price generating process, data generating process is in the news. So that's the difference. That's the only difference. And we have this result. OK? All right, so interpretation and so on. So let's look at some pictures. So it's kind of hard to believe. So when I first to make this assertion, my coarser didn't believe it. So we place a bet. And, uh, and uh, he's from Vancouver. And uh, we place a bet for the nice dinner. And the Vancouver for a very nice dinner compared to Champagne. So I, always, I, I have really nice dinners for throughout this project anyway. So let's look at this picture. Uh, this is a kind of frequency that uh, pi t equal 1. So when sigma v is large, so when the, this noise uh, innovation process is large, then the, just look at the, this one, this bar. Uh, when sigma v is uh, 0 0.005, around 60% of the time, you believe model is a time varying parameter model. But as sigma v goes to zero, the frequency is increasing. So here's the number. So as sigma v goes to zero, the, the proportion of time where, so after 2,000 rounds of simulations, okay, I count the number of sample paths where pi 2,000 is close to one. 
where pi 2000 is close to zero. The sum does not have to be one, but as you see, when you add these two, it's close to one. So in other words, after 2000 period, pi t must be either one or zero. And the frequency that the sample pass stick to, uh, is stuck to pi equal one start increase as sigma goes to zero. Okay? So that's one of the observations. So if you plot the sample pass of pi t, uh, around half of the time, around 45% of the time, you will see sample pass like this. Pi t just uh, jiggle around, then sometimes it goes to zero. The so vertical axis is pi, uh, horizontal axis is t, and uh, if you do simulation around the 5,000 round, this is kind of 40% of time you observe. However, around 40% of time, this is what you observe. It's really frustrating, as a matter of fact, because it's not supposed to happen. If you, if you believe in uh, model averaging, this is not supposed to happen, right? Because uh, model averaging should help you to learn equilibrium. And after a certain round, even if you start this uh, initial value pi close to zero, it's just hovering around zero, then goes to one. But the interesting thing is, the way how it converges to one is always like this. It's not gradual. Whenever it goes to one, it goes one very quickly. That's another puzzle. I, we did some little bit more simulations. So it's a, out of these four panel, the first one is a price, and the second one is pi. So let's focus on these two ones. So look at the pi. That's a very typical sample pass of pi that goes to one. If you start, even though it starts around zero for a while, okay, just move around zero. So it looks like, oh, I'm safe. Not so fast, not so fast. After a certain round, it starts to move very quickly. The problem is, as you, if you believe in time-varying parameter model, your forecast is noisier. Right? As a result, resultant price become noisier. So see the increase of volatility on the left panel? In other words, as you switch your, mo switch your model from constant parameter model to time-varying parameter model, the actual price volatility start increase. And this is an example where this price volatility increased by 150% overnight. Who caused this increase of volatility? Now you, here, here. Am I dreaming? No, no, I'm a Bayesian. I update my pi t according to Bayes rule. So I... I have a belief, and it's kind of self-confirmed. And the volatility increased by 150% overnight. No apparent reason. And this is one of the observations. So what, whenever this pi t switch from zero to one, it switches such a rapid manner. And you will see this kind of sample pass around 40% of the time. So the second picture is like that. At first, pi t goes, looks like it converges to zero, so you look safe. No, 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 no. Sooner or later, it will hit certain shock, but it goes very rapidly to one, and it puts, it's stuck over there. Okay. The question is why? But that's not the, that's not the older case. So this is a left panel is a case where it converges, pi, pi t converges to zero, at a certain point, it just jump. looks like it jumped to the one, but there is no discontinuity in this model. Okay? It jumped to the one, looks like it jumped to the one, and stuck there. On the other hand, it's a, on a rare case, like uh, one out of 100 experiments, you will see path, path like that. Like a pi t goes to one, and gradually goes to zero you will see paths like that. So throughout this exercise, what I did was uh, 
run the simula long simulation many, many times, usually like a 5,000 period simulation for around 10,000 10, times, and classify different sample paths. And these are the four very typical cases. Ready? Correct. It's a it's a pie. I'm, I'm plotting pie. So 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 you're doing the wrong model because of this. More volatile. So you you behave as if you believe this beta t evolve according to random walk, which it does not. If you believe in M1, beta t converge to the mean of beta t converge to rational expectation. Yeah. It's a convergence notion of convergence weaker. So, so how much of this depends on random walk in order to create a evolved according to random walk? And random walk is really you know, exploding process. So if you explode the unit two and beta t is equal to, say, gamma, Uh, I didn't check that. I didn't check that. I just uh, take what they what they did and uh, compare it. And you are right. It's a it's a the puzzle is uh, locally these two are very difficult to uh, distinguish, but in the long run you can distinguish. But uh, because beta t is controlled, so it has still it still has a stationary distribution. So our exercise is what what is going on. So this is what our goal is. So there are three variables of interest along with the sigmas, but the, sig the conditional variance behave in a rather predictable way. So I will focus on beta t, beta t zero, which is a conditional mean of a constant parameter model, beta t one, which is a conditional mean of a time varying parameter model, and pi t. So basically, I just uh, open the 400 so page, so 433, whatever, or Hamilton's book, and copy it out. So beta t and sig uh, beta t1 and the sigma t1 evolve over the Kalman filter. And because of this innovation term, it, sigma, t, uh, sigma t1 converges to some positive number. Uh, in the constant parameter model, sigma t converges to 0 at the rate of 1 over t. And uh, evolution of pi t is uh, highly nonlinear. So, but uh, there, there is a well-known formula for that. So, pi t is a probability that the model one is correct. So, one minus pi t is a probability that model zero is correct. So, this ratio is known as odd ratio. You should know more than I do. You're from Yale. So its odd ratio is a product of a likelihood ratio of the t. So that's what I, so ak0 is a density function of Gaussian distribution on the model zero. ak1 is a Gaussian distribution of on the model one. And the ratio is known as a likelihood ratio. And the product of this uh, likelihood ratio represent uh, this uh, uh, odd ratio. So that complete the dynamic system. So we have to analyze asymptotic property of this object. Just help me think about this. Your analytical results were first you take t bar to zero and then you take sigma squared to zero. So the sigma squared and t goes to zero, the two models of similar. Yeah. That's that that's what we thought. But uh, no, 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 but, but but just so Actual process of what? Well, you were showing us the simulations. You were showing us the price models. Yes. If the two models are similar in a way, why? 
Uh, that's a very important question. Can I come back to that question uh, toward, uh, kind of in 30 minutes? And uh, I, wanna, I wanna answer that in a more precise way. Okay, that's a very important one. So her question is this. And this is a kind of one of a puzzle. So when sigma v equals zero, two models are the same, okay? So when sigma v is a very small but positive, then you have every reason to believe these two models should be close. Therefore, sample pass property must be close. The, the reason why I'm pointing Michi is, here comes his question. So when it's a, but the random walk in the long run, if you look at the random walk process of beta, it doesn't have a stationary distribution. But in the constant parameter model, it has a well-defined limit. Therefore, this notion of closeness is quite misleading. And that's something I'm exploiting. But let me get back to this point after I present the analytic result, okay? Because it's uh, related to uh, Mitch's earlier work. So this is what we are going to do. This is not a nice system because uh, this uh, odd ratio, evolution of odd ratio is highly nonlinear. And uh, these two beta t1 and beta t0, I have no idea at first. Okay. In fact, this is where this, uh, this guy's got problem. So these guys, so you, you know Tom, you know Tom. So, and uh, he's the one who proposed, uh, kind of introduced us how to solve this kind of recursive system. Uh, he proposed the way how, you know, to analyze the asymptotic property of beta, we should look at the uh, uh, expected value of this updating term and approximate the sample pass through ordinary differential recursion system and so on. Uh, if you do that, you, you got stuck. And that's where you got, they got stuck. And uh, if you are trying to solve this uh, five variable, five equation at the same time, it, you got nowhere. So first observation is this. Even though beta t1 and beta t0 looks very similar, they evolve in a very different speed. We are interested in the case where t is very large. Look at the beta t1 and look at the Kalman gain. This uh, sigma t1 over sigma square, sigma t1 zt square. And because this sigma t1 is bounded away from zero, this Kalman gain is bounded away from zero. So when t equals very large, the increment of beta t1 is some kind of bounded away from zero. So it's kind of in the long run, you can take a constant step over time, right? But look at the beta t0. As t goes infinite, sigma t0 goes to zero at the rate of one over t. So when t equals very large, this increment becomes very small, okay? So when t is very large, beta t1 evolves much faster than beta t0. Okay. So in other words, like a beta t is moving at the speed of light. When you, when you are moving at the speed of light, everything else looks like it's constant. Right? So that's kind of idea we're gonna use. That's known as a, like a two time scale stochastic approximation method. So what we are doing is, first we observe beta t1 evolve fastest rate, and beta t0 evolve at the rate of average. It's average. And then we, the next step, we need some more proof. Pi t0, pi t, move to the neighborhood of zero or one, but once you approach zero and one, it evolved much slower rate than average. So in other words, all three variables, beta t1, beta t0, and pi t, evolve at a different speed. Because it's evolved at different speed, instead of solving these three variables at the same time, beta t1, beta t0, beta pi t at the same time, we solve in a sequence. So we first solve fix pi t beta t0 as a constant, and given treat it as a constant, 
let's calculate with, with, where beta T1 converge. Assuming that beta T1 already achieved at the stationary distribution, where is the uh, limit point of beta T0? Assuming that beta T0 and beta T1 already achieved the limit, what's the limit of pi T? So by solving three systems in a sequence, we can pin down the asymptotic property in a very precise way. Okay. So that's the next step. So that's that. So that's the different speed. So that's what we do. Okay. So let's fix uh, beta t zero, beta t zero, and pi pi as constant. It's not constant, but the, when t is very large. Because it evolves so slowly, I can treat it as a constant. Okay? Then uh, we can approximate that the uh, evol evolution of beta T1 as uh, the following uh, stochastic process known as uh, differential, stochastic differential equation known as uh, einstein ullenbeck uh, equation, and which we know has a stationary distribution. But uh, this stationary distribution is centered around, some, uh, around the mean which is parameterized by pi and beta zero. Now, once you solve that, move backward. Then you solve the limit of beta zero and move backward. So by solving this way, you can prove this system has two locally stable points. One is where pi equals zero is one locally stable point, and the other one is pi equals one is on a locally stable point. So we have two locally stable points in this system. So now the question is the duration time of pi t between the two. Okay. So in terms of this nature of exercise, this is very closely related to uh, Mitch's work with uh, George Melas and Rafael Rob on the evolutionary game theory, where they talk about the duration time of a popula population proportion of people who use a particular strategies. Okay. But the exercise is more complicated because it's a, it's a much higher dimension. We are talking about not a single state, we are talking about three states. And that's what makes this exercise kind of more difficult. All right. So, this is kind of puzzle we have to solve. So remember, look at the separate pass. Whenever pi t move from zero to one, it looks like it jump all the time. It never go. It never go gradually. Never, never. Trust me. If you if you simulate this system. Whenever pi t switch from zero to one, it looks like that all the time. But when pi t switch from one to zero, it's always gradual. Never jump back, never. And that's a question I, I'm interested in. And why does it happen? And second, why sigma v is a small, small why, they stay, say, why it is so much difficult to deviate from the neighborhood of one rather than deviate from neighborhood of zero. So to do so, we have to uh, identify the domain of attraction and so on. But we, because this, uh, we are dealing with uh, three-dimensional dynamics, it's kind of rather involved. So instead of going through the details, let's just give me some heuristic idea about why it is exponentially more difficult to deviate from pi equal one rather than deviate from pi equal zero, okay? Uh, actually, I have uh, some drawing uh, for the domain of attraction like that, but uh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Okay. So for the sake of conversation, let's imagine beta t, beta t one, this is the fastest moving guy, already reach rational expectation equilibrium, okay? And then let's look, look at the cross-section of that state so that 
this is x uh, axis of beta t1. Okay, this horizontal axis is beta zero, and vertical axis is pi. Okay? Instead of talking about three-dimensional pictures, let's assume that beta t1 already reach rational expectation equilibrium. I look at the cross section of the state. Okay, so I just cut cut the domain the state where beta t1 equal rational expectation value and the cross section of the domain of attraction looks like. That. Okay. So you can point, I can point out the top point, okay, pi equal one, it's typo, pi equal one, and the beta zero is uh, delta over whatever alpha rho is a locally stable point, and uh, pi equals zero, and uh, delta over minus alpha rho is another locally stable point. And I have to explain to you why it is exponentially more difficult to deviate from top locally stable point to down, and why then from down to up. And second, why whenever there is a deviation from, escape from bottom uh, locally stable point, why escape is such a drastic? That's the second question I have to answer. Okay? So here is the intuition. Suppose you are in the world where I believe true data generating process is constant parameter model. So we are at the, this uh, bottom here. Okay. So I believe the world is the data. I believe the data is generated by constant parameter model. I believe so. So almost all the time, by the law of large numbers. Uh, beta t should be close to this rational expectation value. Almost all the time, I have a good forecast. Okay? Because the uh, least square estimator or uh, Bayesian learning process is a consistent estimator. So almost always, I, the forecasting error is very small. Okay, so far, so good. That's kind of event that happens all the time. Now, Suppose, suppose there is a big gap between my forecast and the realized price. This is not a usual event, but uh, it can happen with a small probability. Right? In, the, in the same sense as a uh, sample average may deviate from population average by large amount, by, with a small probability. Okay, so this is a real event. So let's imagine what's that, what happened after that. Okay? So it's a, because I believe world is, uh, data is generated by, data is generated by uh, constant parameter model. So my forecast beta t0 is kind of hovering around the rational expectation value with very little noise. Because of that, the my forecast price is very stable. And because of that, realized price is very stable. So world is calm. Okay. Because of that, uh, constant parameter works really well. Because uh, this uh, time varying parameter model is also a good estimator, but it's noisier. Because of the data generating process is a kind of stable, kind of with small noise, the Forecast with a large noise is a, has a disadvantage. So that's why this pi zero is a equilibrium. Now, however, there can be some episode where my forecast has a large focusing errors. Let's imagine what happened after that. Even though I assign pi t equals zero, therefore I believe data is generated by constant parameter model, time varying parameter model with locking behind, right? So as soon as there is a large focusing errors, 
beta T1 moves to get, uh, get rid of focusing errors, and beta T0 is moving to get rid of these uh, focusing errors. But because a constant parameter model, but because time varying parameter model works move much faster, remember that? Because it's a Kalman gain does not vanish to zero, whenever there is focusing errors, time varying parameter model or just is coefficient much faster so that it reduces focusing error much better than constant parameter web, parameter model. Is it, is it clear? So when, as soon as there is a kind of large focusing errors, model zero and model one kind of competing each other to produce better forecast. Question is, which model produce better forecast faster? The one that adjusts better, quick, more quickly produce better forecast faster. If that's the case, what's the response of the pi? The decision maker assign higher, higher weight to the better forecast model, which is pi one. Okay? Then what happened? Because I take a more noisier prediction, because of this feedback process, price dynamics become noisier. If the price process becomes noisier, then there is a more chance of large, large focusing errors. If there is large focusing errors, time varying parameter model works even better. If it is working even better, then pi t will increase even faster. That's why whenever there is a large deviation in the focusing errors, because this is a kind of a reinforcement process, this deviation from 0 to 1 is very rapid. Okay? Whenever there is a large focusing errors, time varying parameter model wipes out the focusing error more quickly. Because of that, pi t is increasing. Because of feedback process, data become noisier. As a result, time varying parameter model is a better model. As a result, pi t increase again and that process continues until it reaches pi t, pi t comma. So that's why this deviation from zero to one is rapid. It's not, it's not really overfitting because uh, there are only two models. It's, number of parameters are fixed. So it's not an issue of overfitting. It sounds like the more responsive. Yes, that's all. No, it's not. It's, it does not. It does not. It does not. That's all. That's right. That's right. So let's check from here. So let's see whether the same intuition works. Okay. So let's think about the world is here. So in this world, the decision maker believes the world uh, data is generated by the time varying parameter model. Because he believes time generating uh, time varying parameter model, world is noisy. Because the world is noisy, time varying parameter model is a good estimator. Therefore, you put pi equal one. That's why pi equal one is a locally stable point. Okay? Now, suppose there is a large focusing errors. Then there is a co competition between constant parameter model and time varying parameter model. Which model wins? Time varying parameter model wins. Therefore, this kind of feedback does not exist from this neighborhood. Whenever there is a large focusing errors, time varying parameter mode kicks in and just wipes out the uh, focusing errors. Therefore, pi t has no chance to go to decrease. So in order to move from in order to move from in order to move from here to here, you need a sequence of bad shocks all the time. 
So that's why the transition is much more difficult because you need many bad shocks and transition is gradual. This expression can indicate that it's much easier to deviate from here to here than here to here. That's where we have to calculate these uh, large division parameters, and we can prove that. Any questions? Remember, without feedback, this doesn't happen. Okay? In a system without any feedback where my belief cannot influence the data generating process, this kind of asymmetry does not show up. The only because my belief, because I believe the world is noisy, therefore data generating process become noisier. This, without this process, we do not have this result. By the same token, when alpha rho is less than half, therefore feedback parameter alpha is small, because the feedback is weak, constant parameter model can survive. But when feedback is strong, so that the alpha rho is bigger than half, then this strong feedback makes my belief self-confirmed. So much of the volatility is generated by my, my belief. But my belief has to be self-confirmed. Even if I have uh, access to a model that leads to rational expectation equilibrium. Uh, this is very typical, I think. So I don't think it's a simple average. I don't think it's a simple average. What's going to happen with your model if I fix, exogenous fix that uh, level of gap in the block normal? Yeah, then, then, the, then the, they just come. The, uh, in the long run, uh, beta t0 and beta t1 converge to rational expectation equilibrium and pi constant. So the fact that pi t is moving along is a very crucial for this kind of dynamics. Yeah. So let's go back to Max question. Ooh, what's wrong with this? Something is really wrong. This guy is a Bayesian econometrician, probably one of the most sophisticated econometricians you can think about. But in the long run, this issue maker believes in something he believes in. Right? Because he starts with the uh, kind of noisy world, and he looks at the data. Oh, data is noisy. So my belief is correct. So in a certain sense, this, uh, volatility is self-confirmed. But source of volatility has nothing to do with fundamentals of economy. So the fundamental difference is about this closeness comes from there. Okay. When sigma v equals zero, two models are the same. But whenever there is a small sigma, uh, sigma v is bounded away from zero, in the long run, two models differ very much. So that's kind of a misleading feature of the distance. But locally, locally, over a short in time interval, it's a well-known problem in econometrics. Differentiating this random walk process from the constant parameter model is uh, extremely difficult. That's why this uh, detection of misspecification is very hard. So that's the more econometric uh, explanation of why, why decision maker cannot detect something is wrong. It is so hard to detect. Okay. Any, any more questions? I don't get depressed. Is that is. It's not too bad, isn't it? So, don't get depressed because uh, I'm going to give some positive answer. So when I present this, uh, uh, actually Hugo Sonnenschein asked me, okay, you show me, you show me how bad uh, Bayesian model average can go. So could you give me some alternative? Okay. So I show you, I show you that uh, 
if I, if, I, if I am committed to constant parameter model, then I learn rational expectation equilibrium. But if I have a little bit of suspicion about, little bit of suspicion about the validity of this model, I may believe something else. Okay, so it's, it's more like a lack of robustness of model averaging process. The question is, is there any other process where I have some chance to use correct model, i.e. constant parameter model, with some past probability? Okay. So let me give some alternative process. So this has to do with uh, this uh, This is, uh, I think this uh, uh, Rani mentioned briefly. In a certain sense, if you look at uh, this uh, agent in the learning models, they don't look very smart. In the following sense, I make a forecast, forecast turns out to be wrong. But, I, but I'm committed to believe this model again. I make a forecast, forecast is wrong but I believe I use the same model again to make a forecast. Okay? So in that sense, there, there is a very strong assumption of commitment to a particular model in the conventional learning models, which sounds very suspicious, actually, okay? because uh, if you look at the uh, policymakers, they change the model. Because they are aware their model can be a, is a only approximation, only approximation, they always suspicious about validity of their model. So instead of sometimes instead of simply averaging different model, what they do is they test their model. So before you present this model to a policymaker, they make sure this model survive so sort the of econometric test so that it's a good approximation. And uh, if the model fails the test they propose different model. So let's think about this process, which we go, I, I'm gonna call validation process. Okay? So start with a set of models. So uh, the, actually this is what a uh, policymaker does. So they have a different models on the table. Okay? So at time t, there's a particular model. So before you present this model to your policymaker, you run the test. Uh, let's assume that they use the particular test known as a Lagrangian multiplier test. Uh, the reason why we choose this is because it's a simple and easy to understand and it does not require to specify H1. So, so essentially, uh, theta, theta T is a test statistic, statistics that says, uh, look at this updating term. This updating term, this is nothing more than the normalized focusing errors. And uh, if the normalized focusing error is reasonably small, then you accept, otherwise you reject. Okay? So think about following exercise. So at the beginning of time t, I, ha I have been using a particular model. Okay? And, uh, but uh, I'm not gonna use it blindly. Okay? Because I'm kind of suspicious whether it's a good model or a bad model. And uh, I'm really suspicious about the unmodeled uh, structural change. So before I present this model to uh, Bernanke, for example, I test by running this specification test. If it test, I let them use this model to make a forecast and make a, make a decision. PT is realized and update so that this model is ready for use for next round. Next period, I put this model, put the test again, and as long as it survives the test, I use this model. Is it clear? Okay. This is different from the this is different from the model averaging process because the model averaging process is more like a horse race between two models. Whenever there is a large focusing errors, two models are kind of competing to each other to get rid of foca uh, focusing errors. So data is generated by two models at the same time. But here in this validation process, 
policymaker is using the same model until it falls apart. Okay? And once they switch to another model, you continue to use this model until it fails the test. So in each period, model it, the data is generated by a single model. Okay, so that's the difference. And uh, this, is not, this is pretty good description of this uh, policymaker's model choice. Uh, for example, uh, uh, US monetary policy these days is guided by Taylor rule. This is particular class of model they use. And if you ask them, why do you use Taylor rule? Or why do you use a new Keynesian whatever? The answer is quite simple, because uh, it's a measurable model, easy to understand, and works well. Okay? And uh, if you look at the history, in old days, they don't use this model. They did not. They did not. Before 1980, 19, uh, 1980 they used different class of models. They used to use a short-term Phillips curve to guide their monetary policy. Then uh, following this uh, great moderation, they switched to different class of model for a long time. So this idea, this uh, validation process is also a de very descriptive way of kind of reasonably accurate description of policymakers' behavior. Okay? So now, so let's think about the following exercise. So you are the policymaker. Here's one model. And uh, you have to take us to something based on this uh, uh, asset pricing mo model. One model says, well, beta may be constant. Another model says, no, 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 beta evolve according to random walk. Okay? So each time you have to choose a particular model. And before you use this model, you subject this model to the specification test. Okay? You, you continue to use it until it fails the test. Once it fails the test, you switch to different model and continue, on, you continue to use it until it fails the test. Question is, what is the frequency, average frequency of using particular model? And in the long run, which model is used most often? So it's more like a duration type exercise, but uh, it's a duration over models rather than equilibrium outcomes. Can you guess? Actually, this is another place I place a bet. Okay. So here is a model which is a noisy model. So if you know this, uh, this uh, test and uh, test process, you, you, guys, you guys know much better than I do. But uh, here is a one model which generates a small noise and here is another model that generates a larger noise in terms of forecasting errors. And uh, you use one model as long as uh, it passed the specification test, and you switch back and forth. Which one do you think you use most often? Any guess? You are statistics difference, Kevin. Time, time variant model. Time invariant or time variant? In, could you tell me why? That's one argument, actually. That's one argument. Uh, that, but on the other hand, on the other hand, don't forget this omega part. So test statistic is divided by lambda is a focusing error, correct? And omega is a noise in the focus uh, forecast. So when the noise is very large, it's it's more difficult to reject the hypothesis, actually. Okay. So some argument in favor of this uh, time variant model is because of this uh, inherent noise in, in the self-conforming equilibrium, it becomes much more difficult to reject the hypothesis.
Actually, that's that's a, that's a conjecture my my co-also made actually, and for the for that reason, it's because a small noise. Once you got into to the uh, uh, ratio, neighborhood ratio expectation equilibrium, it becomes rare to be to get rejected. Makes sense because uh, self -confirm, in the self confirm equilibrium, your model is self confirmed, meaning it's not rejected. Any other challenge? Time of suspense, yes. Uh, it's uh, equal probability, actually. <laughs> it's equal probability. This is kind of sense where sigma v goes to zero, two models become very similar in this sense. When sigma v is small, in a certain sense, these two uh, estimation processes are very similar. And this is one way to confirm that intuition. Look. Whether you update, whether you update uh, your estimator at, at the rate of 1 over t or at the constant rate, it's an estimator with an error correction process, and the only speed is different. In other words, the chance of rejection is more or less the same. And we can prove as a sigma v goes to 0, the duration time of two different models is the same. Hard to believe, eh? So here is a plot. So when, uh, when sigma v is large, when sigma v is large, your intuition is correct. Your intuition is correct. And that's, what, that's why my course believes, my course believes uh, time invariant models should be used most of the time. However, as a sigma v goes to zero, these two estimation process is more or less the same. Therefore, chance of a surviving specific chain test should be more or less the same. And as uh, sigma v goes to zero, it com uh, chance of one model is, uh, I think it's this chance of uh, time invariant model is chance of time variant model is used, start to creep up, and it converge to half. So at least I can give uh, some 50% chance of winning of the time invariant model. So this is kind of, so I, the role of sigma v is very kind of uh, subtle. In one case, there is a kind of discontinuity in terms of uh, asymptotic distribution of beta t. But in another case, w when it comes to the uh, situation of a testing a a hypothesis, it's more or less the same. Any questions? Um, I, this is some kind, I, I don't want to ha uh, have a conclusion. This, this, this talk doesn't have a conclusion anyway. Uh, but uh, I want to just uh, uh, wrap up this talk with some kind of open questions. Uh, this is kind of question I, I want to pursue, but uh, I didn't make any uh, progress past five years, for example. The dynamics of the evolution of the model is not well known. Okay? So if you ask uh, policymakers who are kind of a subject to model uncertainty, so you don't know what the true model is. Right? And uh, according to Lars Hansen, all models are misspecified by definition. Okay? Why? Because in order to construct a model, what do you do? You take out the model, kind of certain parameters which you think is not important. Right? Therefore, your model should not should not should have some variable which should have been there. Otherwise, you cannot construct a simple model. Therefore, all models are misspecified. And if you know that, you have every reason to explore different models. And uh, this uh, evolution of model is not arbitrary. And it should guide a certain principle. And uh, what is the kind of uh, how the model evolves over time? 
that's kind of a exercise I didn't see any kind of uh, important result yet. Although this indicate, so in this case, we have so, so, some idea about what's in the long run, what's the, what kind of model is used most often. But still, this exercise does not clearly tell you some dynamics over the models. I think this is something uh, you guys might want to think about. No conclusion. No conclusion. This is the last slide. Any questions? This is exactly the kind of question you guys should investigate. Could you repeat? Could you repeat for the for the rest of students? I think this is a really important question. You put much better than I did. Yes. But if uh, I introduce another model, not the random one, maybe one step or one, maybe I can watch the. That's right. And uh, therefore, therefore, the yes, therefore, what's, uh, in, such a, in such a case, if you're the inside of the model, how do you, you want to construct a new model, and so on? And uh, that's the kind of question that I do not have an answer. I think this is something you should you think about. Uh, that's, the, that's the place where my course was complaining about because for him, for him, uh, point zero 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 five is small enough. That's, that's right. Yeah, but it's a complete different in the, uh, when it's become even more smaller. There's something I don't know. There's something I don't know. So this is just kind of a kind of this exercise has a kind of fundamental flow in a certain sense. It's a, it's a kind of I will interpret it as a limit result. But the no, no. Uh, this is a question about which which sigma v is small enough, right? right. And uh, I don't think that's kind of a, that's kind of question. We do not have any good answer. No, no. Moreover, this uh, numerical exercise is kind of hard because uh, this convergence rate of this uh, this large diff parameter is very slow, very slow. So numerical exercise uh, does not give a good answer either. So moreover, uh, you, you hit the kind of soft spot, as a matter of fact. What is, sigma v, what is small enough sigma v? So I'll take this result more like a, a theoretical prediction rather than empirically relevant. So in that sense, your prediction is correct. Your prediction is correct. Because uh, when sigma v is a reasonable range, then time invariant model is more often selected. So I, I, in that sense, I, I, I think his, his prediction is correct. OK? I have one empirical question. Ooh. Now you have a Bayesian mixture of two. 
That's what they do. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Whenever, whenever we choose the uh, time invariant model, it does not fit very well. And the, uh, it, it, it fit the mean very well, but the volatility part is just uh, completely off the chart. Okay, let's go for lunch.